we're very glad to have Siddharth Cannon from Brown visiting Cambridge, uh, who will tell us about moduli like relative stable maps to P1, cut and paste and variance. All right, uh, thanks Ravi for the introduction and for the invitation to speak here. And uh, thanks to the audience for uh, coming. So allow me to start in sort of a very imprecise, broad way. Uh, I just wanna say something about how I see this project uh, fitting into sort of a, a greater uh, mathematical context. So, so the, the space I'm gonna tell you about today uh, is, is some moduli space of, of relative stable maps. Uh, right now, you don't really need to know uh, what this thing is. Uh, and I'm gonna specialize to a, a particularly elementary case. But in broad terms, like what, what is the space uh, parametrizing? So, so the word relative uh, uh, is, in the, is in the name. So, so it should, we should start with like a variety together with a divisor. And uh, we're interested in, in mapping curves uh, to our variety, maybe marked curves. And uh, we should think of this, this, this X in the notation as, as somehow encoding like contact orders uh, of, the, of the curve with the divisor. Um, and this moduli space of relative stable maps uh, compactifies uh, the moduli space of maps from smooth curves uh, with prescribed uh, contact orders. And uh, for, for now, we don't really need to think about how uh, the compactification works. Um, but uh, broadly speaking, uh, and maybe uh, on some really basic level, uh, relative gromov witten theory uh, is concerned with associating numbers uh, to these spaces of relative stable maps. And these numbers are maybe called relative gromov witten invariants. And, and the way we get these numbers is, is via intersection theory. And maybe in the, in the best of times, uh, these numbers are actually counting something, but, but we're whether or not they're enumerative, we're still interested in these numbers and, and the structures they may have. And the, the project I'm, I'm telling you about today is, is maybe a, a different way of extracting numbers from a space of relative stable maps, uh, in particular sort of constructible invariants. So invariants of the, of the class of the variety in the Grotendieck ring of varieties. And of course, there's, there's a few ways to uh, extract numbers from the, the class in the Grotendieck ring. We could look at Betty numbers or, or Hodge numbers, but uh, today I'm gonna be uh, elementary and just talk about the Euler characteristic. So, so we're, gonna, we're gonna get numbers from our, our moduli space via the Euler characteristic. And I'm gonna say something about the class uh, in the Grotendieck ring of varieties. Okay, so maybe let's, let's get a little bit more precise. So, so my, my vector x is going to be uh, a sum zero vector of integers, uh, non-zero integers. Um, and let me define for you a genus zero relative map to P1. Uh, so we're, we're looking at maps from an n marked P1 to P1 relative to zero and infinity with uh, ramification profiles over zero and infinity somehow specified by x. And, and what does this mean? Uh, we, we were looking at cartoons like this. So my target is a, you know, a sphere with zero and infinity marked. And uh, we required that the, the pre-image of zero is those marked points uh, corresponding to positive uh, in, in entries in our vector X. And the, the pre-image of infinity is those marked points corresponding to negative uh, entries in X. And um, uh, we're gonna require that our map F ramify at the ith marked point uh, with ramification index given by the absolute value of, of xi. So, so that's why this, this vector uh, needs to be a sum zero uh, vector of integers is because if I look at the fiber over any point uh, in, the, in the target and I add up the ramification indices in the fiber over that point, uh, that, that has to be a constant equal to the degree of this uh, branch coming. Right, and I should say, uh, what, what is an isomorphism between two such? It's, it's a commuting square. Uh, in particular, two maps that, that differ only by the torus action uh, fixing zero and infinity on the target are going to be the same for me today. So sometimes that's, that's called the case of a rubber target, uh, but th that's not so important. And so, so let's let M of X be the moduli space of, of these maps. It's a pretty, uh, pretty elementary or 
not too hardcore of a, of a moduli space to wrap our heads around. So this is gonna be the interior of uh, the moduli space we'll be interested in today. Okay, so, so M of X is, is somehow is not so complicated. It's, it's actually just isomorphic uh, to M zero N and you can kind of write it in the silly way as, as M zero N times C star uh, mod C star. So, so what does this mean? It's, it's basically once we, once we specify uh, the zeros and poles, the, the map is determined uh, up to the action of C star on the target, right? Like, so, so choosing a local coordinate, it looks something like this. So I, once, I, once I specify the zeros and poles and the, the, the order of the zeros and poles that determines the map uh, from P1 to P1 up to this constant, but we're, we're declaring two maps to be the same uh, if, they, if they differ by this constant. So, so we really, the, the, this problem just boils down to, to giving endpoints on P1 up to isomorphism. So this interior is just M0N. Okay, so the, the idea is that we're gonna compactify the space uh, by, by you know, viewing it as a space of maps, obviously. And uh, we're gonna parametrize uh, maps from trees of P1s, like arbitrary trees, or somehow almost arbitrary trees to uh, expansions of the target. So uh, an expansion is going to be a, a chain of P1s. Uh, uh, by chain, I mean like literally a path uh, of bubbles. And in this way, we're gonna get a, a system of, of moduli spaces, uh, each birational to M0 N bar. And uh, on the next slide, I'm gonna tell you maybe more carefully uh, how this compactification works. Okay, so, so, so maybe more precisely. So what is a relative stable map to P1? Well, it's, it's really a map to a, a chain of P1s. Uh, so I, I, I have a morphism from an N marked tree of P1s to a chain of P1s. Uh, of course, the, the marked points are smooth points uh, and they're distinct from each other. And uh, you know, zero and infinity here are, are just names for two marked points on the target, but they're, they're required to come, uh, they're required to be on, on the two extreme components. Whenever I have a chain, it makes sense to talk about the, the two unique extreme components of that chain and zero and infinity have to be on those two components. All right, so here's a cartoon. So, so we, we will still require uh, that the pre-image of zero is those marked points uh, corresponding to positive entries and the pre-image of infinity is those marked points corresponding to negative entries. And uh, we still require that F ramifies uh, uh, with degree uh, equal to the absolute value of Xi at the ith marked point. Uh, but now we should, we should probably say something about the nodes as well. So, so the pre-image of a node is a union of nodes. And there, there better be a, a well-defined ramification index at each node. So what does that mean? It means that by passing to the uh, normalization of source and target, I can, I can read off some ramification index on either side of each node. And those have to agree so that it makes sense to talk about the ramification index uh, at a node. Uh, I still, my isomorphisms are still going to be commuting squares of isomorphisms between source and, and target. And uh, you know, requiring stability, which I, I don't really want to get uh, uh, into the weeds uh, talking about stability. But so the the moduli space of all maps with finitely many automorphisms uh, satisfying these properties is going to be uh, m bar of x. So this is the uh, the moduli space uh, uh, we'll be dealing with today. And maybe just to say one thing about stability is that for today, for this talk. Uh, stability just means that each component of the target has at least one pre-image with, with three special points uh, on the source. So, so this component has one pre-image with two special points, but that's okay because it has at least one other uh, with, with, with more than two uh, special points. Okay, so this is, this is the moduli space we're, we're going to be. So this is really, I mean, uh, from the, from the gromov witten perspective, this is maybe the simplest possible a uh, moduli space of, of stable maps, relative stable maps we could work with. Um, but we can ask sort of different questions because it's easy to get, to get our hands uh, or it's possible to, to get our hands on, on the structure here. So I, wa I wanna tell you sort of this first, uh, 
main theorem about the, the class of the moduli space in the Grodendieck ring. Uh, but I, I first have to tell you uh, uh, about this, this chamber structure on the, on the space of uh, ramification data. So, so let's, let, let's let brackets n be the set of numbers from one through n. And uh, for each subset uh, of, of this set of integers, I can, I can define a hyperplane called W sub i. Uh, so, so W sub i is defined by, by requiring the sum of the coordinates, coordinates indexed by, uh, by our subset to be zero inside of Rn. And uh, we're gonna let A sub n be sort of the, the, the wall, uh, the hyperplane corresponding to the biggest set minus all of the other hyperplanes. So, so this, so the, the hyperplane corresponding to the biggest set is, uh, is the one where uh, the sum of all the, the entries is zero and, and certainly our, our ramification data will always be chosen from this hyperplane. And uh, the, the point is that the connected components of what's left over are called resonance chambers. Uh, so in fact, uh, this, this arrangement of hyperplanes is often called uh, the, the resonance arrangement of hyperplanes and, and the chambers, these, these, these big chambers are, are called resonance chambers. And these, these terms, I, I believe, were coined by uh, Shadrin, Shapiro, and Weinstein uh, in their work on, on double Hurwitz numbers, which I'll, I'll, I'll cite uh, more properly later on. Um, so here's an example so of A sub three. So, you know, it, it lives in R3, but it's, it's, it's all in this hyperplane in R3. So I view it as a plane and then there's three walls uh, we're cutting out and there's, there's, there's six resonance chambers here. Okay, so, so uh, now, now with, with that notation in hand, I can state the first, the first main theorem of this talk, which is, so if we, if we view the class of this, this moduli space of relative stable maps in the Grotendieck ring of varieties uh, as a function of the, of the input data, it's it's constant on the on the interiors of resonance chambers. So 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 one remark is that uh, this moduli problem is really representable by a, a Deline Mumford stack, but but throughout the talk I'm just working with the coarse coarse moduli space. So it, it makes sense to take the class of this thing in the Grodendieck ring, and and what does this mean? You know if you're not so familiar with the Grodendieck ring, in particular this means that things like uh, the Betty numbers, Hodge numbers, and Euler characteristic are all constant uh, on the interiors uh, of these resonance chambers. So, so you mentioned that they're all, <clears throat> that all these variants are constant, but uh, I would kind of vaguely expect it to be all left shifts, or is that not gonna be, is it, are these gonna be crazy things? Uh, maybe that, Follows from what I'm going to say, but uh, I'm not claiming I, it's obvious. It's just that I would think I, I would I expect it just because I would know what not know what else to expect. That's which is maybe not a great reason, but maybe it is. I think I think it is all left shots, but uh, you know, don't don't quote me. Uh, I think I think it'll maybe my your question uh, will be answered uh, through you know. When we when we get our hands on, great. Okay, so so let me let me tell you about some of the context. So again, really only scratching the surface. Uh, some of the impressionist history behind uh, this result, or that this result fits into. Um, so so on the enumerative side, there's there's the story of double Hurwitz numbers. Uh, which are counting uh, branched covers of P1 by P1 uh, with ramification over zero and infinity specified by my vector X um, and, and simple ramification everywhere else. Uh, so these double Hurwitz numbers are, are examples of relative genus zero gromov witten invariants uh, of P1 and they can be written as, as integrals. Okay, maybe up to, up to some fudge factor, they can be written as integrals over um, this moduli space we're talking about today, M bar of X. Uh, in the, some polynomial in the psi classes. And, and the, some of the results I wanna cite, so there's this result of Goulden, Jackson, Vakil uh, that uh, H0 of X is a piecewise polynomial function of X. So, so uh, somehow there's a, there's a decomposition of the space of ramification data so that this, this, this double Hurwitz number 
agrees with the polynomial on, on all of the pieces. And then uh, Schadra and Shapiro Weinstein show that the chambers of polynomiality uh, are precisely the, the resonance chambers. Plus they gave a nice wall crossing formula. So, so how to compute the difference of two of these uh, double Hurwitz numbers as you cross a wall. Uh, and, and finally, uh, or not finally, but finally in terms of what I'm gonna cite today, uh, Cavallari, Johnson, and Markwig uh, uh, extended these two results to higher genus um, and, and uh, sort of highlighted and explored some of these connections to, to tropical geometry, and uh, which was maybe explored further by, by the same set of authors. And then one of my advisors, Drew Ranganathan. Um, uh, I, I should say this isn't really a tropical talk, but really a lot of the combinatorics I'm going to talk about later on is, is really inspired by. Uh, uh, these connections to, to tropical, tropical geometry. So, so maybe I just want to emphasize that it was kind of the resonance chambers were sort of clearly the right thing to look at, right? So because we, we already had these results about these integrals over m bar of x, so it, it made sense that maybe you know the class of the Gro in the class in the Grodendieck ring uh, has some structure when you when you look from look at how it varies over uh, resonance chambers. Okay, so I, I maybe shift, shifting gears a little bit, I wanna tell you uh, another, the, sort of the other main theorem of, of this talk, uh, which is about Euler characteristics and sort of a special case. So, so let's specialize uh, the ramification data. So, so let's let X be one positive entry, which is N, and then N negative entries, which are all negative one. Um, so, so these are maps from N to plus one marked curves or marked P1s. Uh, that are that are that are of degree n and, and maximally ramified over zero. So there's only one preimage of zero, which is which which is mapped with ramification index n. And there's n preimages of infinity uh, at which the map is a local isomorphism, right? So locally here it's z maps to z to the n, and around these it's just z maps to z. Uh, and of course this this cartoon is a picture on the interior uh, of the moduli space. In general, we have like trees and chains. Um, and uh, the, the preliminary version uh, of the second theorem I wanna tell you uh, is that there's, a, there's an explicit recursive algorithm to, to calculate the Euler characteristic, the topological Euler characteristic of the space M bar of N, which, which comes from a, a differential equation satisfied by a generating function. So I'll, I'll tell you about that generating function uh, in a little bit. It's, it's not so important right now, it just for now, it's it, the, the point is that we can sort of recursively calculate these Euler characteristics and actually get some numbers. So, so, so the space m bar of n, remember, is, is it's maps from n plus one marked curve. So it's birational to m0 n plus one bar. So it makes sense to, to compare these two uh, topological Euler characteristics. Uh, and uh, maybe, maybe just one thing uh, to point out here. Uh, is that it looks like the Euler characteristic of, of M of N bar sort of grows much faster. So already at N equals eight, uh, this one is like 500,000 and this one's like 15,000. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to say something slightly more uh, precise about that later on. Uh, one thing to note is that, that neither of these spaces have, have any odd cohomology. So this is, this is just the dimension of their, uh, so this is just the total amount of cohomology they have. It's the dimension of the, uh, rational cohomology ring. So maybe the takeaway is a M0 N plus one bar already has a ton of cohomology and, and this, this relative stable map space has a whole lot more. Okay, so now I'll, I'll work towards actually telling you what this, this differential equation is. So, so I need to sort of introduce some, some notation. So inside of M0 N plus one bar, which, which parametrizes uh, uh, stable trees of P1s, uh, I, can, I can look at the locus of curves that have exactly K irreducible components. So that's what uh, this M0 N plus one bar of K is. Uh, it's some, some locally closed uh, stratum. And, and we have this birational morphism from, from M of N bar to M0 N plus one bar. That, that takes a map and, 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 and gives, gives its, its stabilized source curve. So there's a, there's a typo here. 
Uh, there should be n plus one uh, on both sides, but that's okay. The point is that we, we can take the source curve and stabilize and we get a birational map and, and we can define a locus in uh, M of n bar by, by pulling back this locus in, in M zero n plus one bar. So, so in other words, this locus M bar n of k is the locus of maps where if you, you stabilize the source curve uh, that the, the resulting curve will have k irreducible components. So, so the theorem is about this bi bivariate uh, generating function, uh, which is encoding the topological Euler characteristics of these, 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 stratum, these strata m bar n of k, as k and n both vary. And, and the theorem is, is that there's this, 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 different, this, this generating function satisfies some uh, explicit uh, differential equation, uh, the, the, the details of which are maybe uh, not so important for now, uh, but the, the upshot of which is important. The upshot is that there's that this gives us a recursive way of, of computing the, the, not, the Euler characteristics of these strata and hence the Euler characteristic of the whole space because it's, a, it's you just sum the Euler characteristics of these strata. And, and these are empty for K greater than N minus one. So it's just a sum of N minus one terms. Okay, so, so just as I uh, gave some, some uh, historical context for the, the first result, I wanna give some context for the second result. And, and the main context is, this, is, is sort of separate work of Getzler and Menin on the Euler characteristics of, um, uh, of, of M0 N plus one bar. Uh, and and this, is really, this is really one of my, the theorems one of my favorite theorems, one of the theorems I find sort of uh, most uh, inspirational. Um, so you can, you can introduce these two uh, sort of exponential generating functions, I mean, up to some shift. Uh, so nu of t is encoding the topological Euler characteristics of these open moduli spaces in genus zero, and nu bar of t is encoding the Euler characteristics of the compactified uh, moduli spaces. And sort of the, 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 beautiful, the beautiful theorem is that these, these two uh, formal power series are, are inverse to each other under composition uh, of power series. Uh, so, so this means that once you know one, uh, you really, you can recursively compute the other one. Uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty elementary to get your hands on the Euler characteristic of the open, open moduli space. You just use the forgetful map as a vibration and you can just, you get a closed form for nu of t. Uh, which is here, it's explicit. And so, so you can recursively compute, you know, your computer all day can, can calculate these Euler characteristics uh, of, of M0 N plus one bar. And uh, so something really cool about this theorem is that there, there's no reason, there's nothing special about the Euler characteristic here. In, in both of these generating functions, you could replace uh, the Euler characteristic with, with the class and the grown deep ring of varieties and, and the theorem would, would still be true. So, so this really, it's, it's more than just telling you a way to calculate the Euler characteristics. It's also telling you uh, how to calculate like the, the Poincaré polynomials. Uh, and, and, and a similar idea was used uh, by Getzler and Ponderapande uh, in a beautiful paper where they, they, they recursively calculate the Betty numbers of the uh, conservative space, uh, conservative space of stable maps to uh, projective space uh, from, from genus zero from rational curves. Uh, and, and all of this somehow it boils down to the, the enumerative combinatorics of trees and sort of similar combinatorics uh, go into the proof uh, of the, the differential equation I showed you on the previous slide. Okay, so uh, let's, let's, let's get our hands on this, on this moduli space. Um, so maybe the most important thing uh, for, for working with this, this space in the Grundig ring is that we, we can stratify it by, by some combinatorial type. What does this mean? So, so every morphism, every point in this moduli space is some 
map of nodal curves and, and nodal curves have dual graphs. So, so we can always, we can discretize uh, each morphism in our moduli space. So what's going on here? Uh, we, we take, we we, here's a cartoon of some, some, some relative stable map and we pass to the dual graph of source and target. The target is always gonna have a pretty uninteresting, you know, it's always a path, right? So the, this tree is always a path. And I should say, uh, in case uh, you're not so familiar with, with dual graphs, you, you put, put a vertex for each irreducible component of your curve, and then you connect two vertices when uh, the corresponding components are uh, uh, joined by a node. And then, and then you add leaf, leaf, so vertices of degree one uh, for each of the marked points. Um, and uh, by the way, we sort of set up our, our moduli problem uh, this is this the the sort of the, the map we get on over here is, is an honest map of trees where, where edges are going to map to edges, uh, vertices are going to map to vertices, leaves are going to map, map to leaves. So it's it's we get some some combinatorial data like this, uh, and we're going to we're going to call the the resulting combinatorial data the the combinatorial type of the map. Okay, so so these are going to somehow these are going to co correspond to the strata of a stratification. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be monitoring the chat here. No, uh, no, definitely not. Uh, okay. People can just ask questions from the chat if they want to. Uh, yeah. All right, sounds good. Um, okay, so 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 this is the the this is the combinatorial type uh, of the map. Okay, so so now let's let's fix let's fix some combinatorial type, some combinatorial data. Uh, and, and we can let M of pi, so pi is my combinatorial type, then let's let M of pi uh, be the, the locus of maps with, with that combinatorial type. And uh, almost tautologically in the Grodendieck ring, we can, we can write our, our, the class of our, our moduli space as a sum over all of the combinatorial types of the moduli space of curves with that uh, combinatorial, or the moduli space of maps with that combinatorial type. Right, and the and the and the big goal, the sort of the first goal of the talk, is to is to convince you, is to show that this sum sum only depends on the resonance chamber containing. Uh, so remember, we had this chamber decomposition, and and this this class in the Grodendieck ring is supposed to only depend on the on the resonance chamber that that contains X. So to, to sort of, so, so I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna give a sort of super detailed proof, uh, but I'm hoping uh, to at least outline some of the, the combinatorics that, that goes into this. And, and the first part of that is uh, to sort of pass between the strata of this stable map space and the strata of the deline mumford knudsen uh, space. And the strata in the, in the latter case are indexed by these things called n marked stable trees. So, so first of all, uh, the, the, a tree is, is always finite and connected uh, in this talk, uh, and a stable tree is one that doesn't have any uh, bivalent vertices, so no vertices of degree two. So I, I say valence for, for the degree of the, the number of half edges emanating from a vertex. And an and n mark stable tree is, is a stable tree together with a bijection uh, between a set of leaves, so a leaf is a is a, is a vertex of, of degree one or valence one. And so it's an n mark stable tree is a stable tree with a bijection between its leaves and the set of numbers from one through n. So just a labeling of the leaves. And, and we can set gamma zero n to be the set of isomorphism classes uh, of n marked stable trees. And, and the point uh, of the set is that it, it, inde it indexes a stratification of m zero n bar. So, so as here's an example. So here's uh, gamma zero four. Uh, so there's four strata. So this, 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 the smallest tree is always the biggest strata or biggest stratum. So this is the stratum of smooth curves in M04, uh, M04 bar. And then there's, there's three boundary strata, which, which turn out to just be points uh, in this case. And of course, uh, the, the, strata, the stratum that a tree corresponds to is precisely the, the moduli space of curves with that dual tree. So it's a, it's a tight correspondence. And uh, I, the, the point of introducing all this is that I wanna pass 
between these strata and the sort of combinatorial types I was, I was telling you about uh, in, in, on the last few slides. So, so towards enumerating these, uh, so there's, a, there's kind of an obvious way uh, to pass between these combinatorial types and, and stable trees. So if I, if I have uh, a combinatorial type, I can kind of just smooth out all of the degree two vertices, they're kind of redundant and get a stable tree, right? Because a stable tree is just one that doesn't have any valence two vertices. But you know, obviously this is a somewhat forgetful uh, operation and, and there might be different uh, combinatorial types uh, that give me the same uh, tree at the end of the day. So maybe we wanna soup this up a little bit so how, how to do that? Well, we can, we can label uh, the internal vertices of the stable tree. And uh, we see that we're getting slightly more than just a tree here. We can get an ordered partition uh, of the internal vertices of our tree. Uh, so, so how does this work? Well, every, anytime I have a path, you know, and I have one end labeled zero and one end labeled infinity, I can just order my path from zero to infinity. And then, Therefore, I can order that this ordering induces an ordering of the fibers over each vertex. So, so, so you know, the fiber over this vertex uh, comes first, and then, and then the second vertex, and so on. Um, uh, and if if we unpack, uh, if we unpack, uh, if we if we look at this labeling, we see that this is the this is the ordered partition we get in this case. Okay, so, so remembering slightly more than just the, the stabilization of the source tree, I want to remember the, the stabilization of the source tree and uh, the associated ordered partition uh, of the internal vertices that I get from the path structure uh, on the target. Okay, so let me introduce some notation. Just I of T is the set. So internal vertex, I, I should have said. So I'm, I'm gonna say internal vertex sort of freely. So internal just means a vertex that's not a leaf. Okay, so the leaves are the, are the external vertices and the internal vertices are the, are the non-leaf vertices. And I'm gonna say I of T is the set of internal vertices of a tree T. And, and using, using this procedure, of the previous slide, we get a map from the set of combinatorial types of stable maps uh, to the set of pairs T comma rho, uh, where T is a stable tree and rho is, is like an ordered, is an ordered partition of the set of internal vertices. And, and the question is, is, is which, which ordered partitions arise in this way? Uh, you know, if we can answer that question, then somehow we eliminate the problem of looking at uh, at, at combinatorial types, which are maybe somewhat unwieldy, and, and we can just kind of work with stable trees, which we, which we maybe were, were more comfortable uh, working with. So, so that's, the, that's the next step of the talk is to, is to say, so which ordered partitions uh, are going to arise. So these ordered partitions are gonna, are gonna depend on some uh, directed tree structure. So, so suppose I have a, a fixed uh, n mark stable tree, and I want to know uh, which ordered partitions of that vertex set uh, arise. And, and I have also uh, ramification data uh, selected from the interior of some resonance chamber. We're gonna, we're gonna use this uh, ramification data to get a, a directed tree structure. So when I say directed tree structure, I mean, uh, we, we just want to orient uh, all of the edges in one direction or another. So, so let's suppose that, that this is my stable tree and, and this is the, the ramification data uh, I've selected. So from this data, I should be able to direct uh, the edges in my tree. So I'm just going to do that by example. So let's, let's start with this edge, the pink edge. So to, do, to delete it we, or to direct it, we first delete it. And of course, in a tree, anytime we delete any edges, uh, that we get two, any edge disconnects the tree. So we'll get two connected components, uh, which I've circled here. And then there's a natural way to associate a weight uh, to each of the connected components, right? So, 
So, so using, using this ramification data, you know, vertex one has weight seven and the sum of the other leaves is, is, has to be negative seven because it's a sum zero uh, vector, but you can also, you know, you can just do it out. Uh, and we're always gonna, we're gonna orient uh, from positive to negative. Okay, so re recapping, we, we delete an edge, uh, we see there, there's a positive side and there's a negative side uh, and, and we orient from positive to negative. And, and there's never going to be any issues uh, in doing this because I'm, I'm for, for throughout this talk, I'm assuming uh, my, my ramification data is selected from the interior of a resonance chamber. So I'm never going to get zero on either side. There's, all, there's always going to be one side that's positive and one side that's negative. And we can, we can continue as such uh, and uh, we get a, a directed, directed tree structure. And uh, for, so let's some ad hoc uh, notations. Uh, let's just call this the X directing uh, of our tree T. And uh, uh, this, this in, in a natural way is gonna give us a partial ordering on the set of internal vertices. So, so how does this work? So, so I've labeled the vertices, the internal vertices V1 through V4. And the partial order is that one vertex is less than another if and only if there's a directed path uh, starting at that vertex and, and ending at the at the second one. So so v1 is less than v2 because there's a directed path uh, from v1 to v2, uh, uh, and v2 is less than v4, and 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 v1 and v3 are are not comparable because there's no directed path uh, between them. Okay, so so why why bother? Uh, Oh, uh, sort of important, important thing to note, uh, really important, is that this, this directed tree structure sort of uh, is, it's apparently only depends on the, the resonance chamber that X was chosen from, right? Like it didn't really matter uh, at this stage that this, this vertex had weight seven and the, the rest of the tree had negative seven. It was just that this vertex had positive weight and the rest of the tree had negative weight. So really, the X directing, this directed tree structure only depends on the subsets which are positive and the subsets which are negative, which is exactly the data of the resonance chamber uh, that the ramification data uh, was, was chosen from. So, so the, point, the point of introducing this directed tree structure is that it lets us parametrize uh, uh, combinatorial types. So it tells us, it answers the question of which ordered partitions uh, arise. So, so there's, there's a bijection between uh, the set of, of combinatorial types of maps uh, whose, if, if I take the source tree and stabilize, I get T and ordered partitions of the set of internal vertices of T, uh, which refine, in, in, in scare quotes, refine the directed tree structure. Uh, so the, the reason I put refine in quotes is that it, 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 you need to unpack this. So, so anytime you get an ordered partition, uh, you get some, there's a natural way to upgrade that to a, to a partial order. And that partial order has to refine the partial order uh, that I defined on the previous uh, slide. So, so let's see this in an example. Uh, so I have my, my stable tree T uh, and my, my ramification data. And uh, I've gone ahead and, and, and oriented all the edges uh, uh, according, according to the rules I laid out uh, on the previous slide. And uh, the partial, so, so let me zoom in so to make sure people can see. So, so in this case, I've, I, there's three internal vertices, which I've labeled uh, V6, V7, and V8. And uh, V6 is less than V7 because there's an ordered path. And V6 is less than V8 because there's an ordered path. Uh, but there's, there's maybe a few ways to refine this ordering. So, so first, uh, there's, there's the sort of coarsest refinement where uh, v6 is less than both v7 and v8, but they're the v7 and v8 are in the same block, so they're they're equal. Uh, then there's the refinement where I put v8 before v7, and then there's the refinement where uh, 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 v7 is before v8. So so these three refinements are the three combinatorial types uh, that where if I take the source tree and stabilize, I get this this tree that I started with. So this this somehow we've reduced the problem. Of enumerating, uh, of enumerating these these maps of trees to just enumerating uh, ordered partitions of of the of the stabilized tree 
uh, that, that refine this directed uh, tree structure. So, so I'm not gonna prove this fact, but it's, it's the main uh, sort of combinatorial uh, engine behind the proof of the, of the first uh, main theorem of this talk. Okay, so so the next the next thing to do is is to parametrize uh, the maps with 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 fixed uh, combinatorial type. So so say so say I have this combinatorial type and I want to parametrize the moduli space of maps with with that combinatorial type. Well, I can I can I can go vertex by vertex uh, on the target tree. So so for this vertex, I have to give a map from a, a thrice marked uh, p one to p one relative to zero and infinity. Uh, with some uh, ramification data, uh, but as we saw at the beginning, you know the, the actual ramification data doesn't matter. This is just an m zero three, which I've written as m zero three times c star mod c star, uh, and it's maybe slightly more complicated when we move to the next vertex because now I have to give two two maps from two thrice marked p ones, and those maps are 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 there's a there's a torus factor. For each of those maps, but I only get to mod out by one one torus factor for the the, the action of the torus uh, uh, on this uh, component. So uh, altogether, in, in the Grotendieck ring of varieties, uh, the class of this of this stratum is as m zero three cubed uh, times c star. So so somehow I'm getting this this excess uh, c star uh, because there's sort of there's two components uh, in the pre image of this component. So, so now we can we can kind of prove uh, we can prove the the first main theorem. Uh, so the, with a, maybe a little bit more notation. So again, let's let's fix let's fix a, a stable n mark tree, and let's let m x of t be the locus of all. So they should say maps uh, where if you stabilize the source uh, tree or the 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 dual tree of the source curve, you get t. Uh, so then, then, then the class of mx of t is a sum over ordered partitions refining this directed tree structure on t. And the, the thing that, that we're summing is a product of these, these open moduli spaces uh, times some torus factor. And I've maybe not told you how this torus factor, the power of this torus factor in general, but it, it turns out to be the co-length uh, of the ordered partition, so 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 the, it's the number of, of of elements in our set which we're partitioning. That's uh, the the set of internal vertices uh, minus the length of the partition, and that that's that's not so hard to show using uh, the intuition I, I I showed you on the previous slide. Um, and uh, like we said, you know this this sum, the indexing set of the sum, sort of clearly only depends on the resonance chamber uh, containing containing my ramification data X. So, so since, since uh, my moduli space, I can write it as a sum of these tree strata, you know, again, almost tautologically, uh, this, this is enough to show that the, the class in the Grotendieck ring is constant on the resonance chamber. So, so modulo, so some, some facts that I've swept under the rug, this is how the, the, first, the first theorem of the talk is, is proven. Okay, so so uh, let me let me now shift gears to talk about the second theorem, um, which is this Euler characteristic. So so of course we can take Euler characteristics on both sides uh, of the equation on the on the previous slide. Uh, so the Euler characteristic of of the moduli space is a sum of the Euler characteristic of these strata, and then uh, again using the equation for the strata as a sum over ordered partitions. Uh, so the contributions we are getting some Euler characteristics of these open uh, uh, n-marked uh, moduli spaces. So so uh, veil. So this means the valence of V. I probably had that on the on the previous uh, slide too. But so 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 this is the the number of half edges uh, connected to a vertex V. And then we get uh, some the, the Euler characteristic of the torus 
uh, to some power. Uh, but of course, you know, the Euler characteristic of a torus is zero. And it's, it's, it's pretty elementary to show that the Euler characteristic of this open moduli space up to a sign is, is, is three less than the number of marked points factorial. Um, so, you know, this, this is almost always going to be zero unless it, it, it so happens that the length of this partition uh, is equal to the number of internal vertices. So rewriting the sum, it's, it's a sum uh, over stable trees, uh, some factor here, which is counting the number of total orderings uh, of the set of internal vertices, which refine the uh, directed tree structure. So it's total orderings because that's precisely when the length is equal to the size of the whole set. And then times uh, some, some weight associated to each of the vertices of the tree. So, so maybe the thing, the thing to emphasize here uh, is that uh, the, this, this last sum, it's really purely, purely combinatorial. Um, and, and maybe the, the only mysterious thing in the sum is this, is this factor of OX of T, which is counting uh, some number of total orderings of the, of the set of vertices that refines uh, the directed tree structure. So uh, in general, I mean, I don't really know what to say uh, about this number OX of T, right? So this directed tree structure, I mean, I told you how to define it, but in general, I mean, it's, it's somewhat mysterious. I mean, you can see that there, for example, uh, it's a directed tree structure where there's no sources or sinks, uh, but I, I don't really know uh, how much more, there's not much more that I know uh, how to say about it. So maybe it's, it's, it's in general hard to, to say what this number is, but the idea is that there's some, some recursive structure uh, we can take advantage of uh, for this, this, special, this special family of, of ramification data. All right, so again, uh, uh, M bar of N is the moduli space uh, of stable, relative stable maps for this particular input data where I have one, one point mapping to zero with ramification index n or, and n points uh, mapping to infinity where, the, where there's no ramification. So, so this last part of the talk, uh, I'm just gonna tell you uh, uh, how, how this recursion, recursion might look uh, in this case. So uh, the point is that uh, in, the, in, in this special case, it's, it's the, the X directing, the directed tree structure is pretty nice. So, so it only depends on the location of the first, the first leaf, right? So, so, so here, the, this is the case when N equals four. So, so remember how I defined uh, this directed tree structure. I said, uh, go to each of the edges one by one, uh, delete the edge, and there's, there's gonna be a positive connected component and a negative connected component. But the way this ramification data is chosen, the positive connected component is always just gonna be the component that contains one. So, so we can kind of just go, go through our tree and direct every edge sort of away from one. And, and some, a way of saying this is that this, this directed tree structure only depends uh, on the rooted tree that we obtain by forgetting uh, all but the first, first leaf of our tree. So, so we can erase the other leaves. They're, they're sort of insignificant for actually directing our tree. Uh, we just, as soon as we know where the root is, we, we know how to direct, direct our tree. And uh, if you recall from a, a couple of slides ago, if we're interested in the Euler characteristic of the moduli space, we're interested in, in counting uh, the number of total orderings of the set of internal vertices of trees that look like this, that refine the partial order uh, imposed by the directed tree structure. And, and the point is that we can uh, uh, do that recursively. Uh, so so how, how does this look in general? So suppose I have some, some maybe large tree T uh, with, with this special ramification data that, that, so that the directed tree structure only depends on this root labeled one. So, so every edge is, is directed away from that root. So, so, so maybe there's some systematic way of, of counting these orderings. So, so we can break, break our tree T 
at this at this base or this vertex that's connected to the root. And, and in this case, I, there's always going to be some trivial edge. And then in this case, I get two sort of non-trivial trees. And you know, the insight is that these trees are kind of, they're sort of a smaller version of the same picture, right? So th these are also rooted trees where the where the directed the directed tree structure uh, is totally is totally determined uh, by the location of the of the root. So and and so I want to count orderings. So it's maybe easy to count orderings on each of these pieces. So so T1 has only two internal vertices and, and they're connected by a directed edge. So there's only one way to order them because they, they've already been ordered for us. T2 has, has three internal vertices and, and uh, one is, is less than the other two, but the other two can be uh, ordered freely. So I, I get two orderings from T2. And uh, whenever I have a bunch of ordered sets, the number of ways to combine them to make an, a big ordered set is always given by some multinomial coefficient. Uh, so in this case, it's just a binomial coefficient because there's only two trees uh, to combine, but it's, it's five choose two, which is 10. So there's 10 ways to combine these orderings. So in, in total, uh, there's, there's 20 orderings of, of this large tree. And you know, maybe we haven't, we haven't said anything too deep here, but the, but, but the point is that the, this is, the, this is this recursion in this problem of, of counting orderings. And, and therefore there's recursion in the problem of, of, of computing these Euler characteristics. Okay, so, so you know, again, sort of sweeping a lot under the rug, I just wanna give you the, the upshot of the, this recursive intuition. So, so recall uh, that m bar n of k is the locus of stable maps, where if I if I stabilize the source curve, I get a I get a, a nodal curve with exactly k irreducible components. Uh, remember these were the these showed up in that bivariate uh, generating function uh, in the second theorem I showed you today. Uh, so so let's define these these auxiliary generating functions called nu sub k of t. So nu sub k of t is a generating function uh, for for the for the uh, for m bar n of k as we vary over all n. It's an exponential uh, generating function. And and the theorem the theorem on these generating functions, which is actually turns out to be equivalent uh, to the differential equation uh, I showed you before, but maybe. Uh, is it's more clear that there's recursion in this in this form of the theorem. So so nu sub m of t uh, is is only going to depend on nu one through nu m minus one if you kind of uh, stare at this formula. So so first of all, I have some derivatives of of nu one uh, of t showing up, and and nu one if you think about it is just a generating function for Euler characteristics of m zero n the open moduli space. So that's okay. And then I have here something that looks like a multinomial coefficient, and then a product of new i's where i is only going from one through m minus one. Okay, so that's that's maybe the thing to focus on uh, in this theorem. So so right, so the right hand side is is only depending on new one uh, through new m minus one, and so so for example, uh, new two of t, which is encoding uh, the the Euler characteristics of the the strata of maps. Where there's there's uh, two components on the source curve upon stabilizing uh, is equal to new one prime times new one. Uh, if you just sort of apply apply this formula in that case, it's it, everything kind of degenerates. So and and it's straightforward to show that new one of t is is can be explicitly determined. You know, it's just one plus t log one plus t minus t. Like I said, this is this is equivalent to the problem of calculating. Uh, the Euler characteristic of m zero n, which is uh, straightforward. Uh, so, so since we know nu one, and the, and the right hand side only depends on nu one through nu m minus one, this totally recursively solves the problem uh, of 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 calculating these 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 topological Euler characteristics. So, so that last formula was from get that was the Getzler Menin thing from before, or what, that looks familiar from. The V1 yeah. T equals that thing there. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, this formula, uh, you you just so new one 
is a generating function for the chi of m0n, basically. And you use the fact that m0n, if you forget a marked point, uh, that map is a vibration. So, so you get some, you get some recursive, some recursion for the uh, coefficients of uh, the Euler characteristics. And it turns out that this is uh, what, this is, this is actually, so I'm not really saying it uh, super clearly, but, but this formula, you don't, you don't need much uh, uh, high-tech technology uh, to, uh, to derive. So it's, it's just, it's totally deduced from the fact that if you forget a marked point on M0N, that map is a vibration. And so like, you know, what are the fibers? It's like P1 uh, minus N points. And you know the other characteristic of that. So you get some, some recurrence. Okay, so, so let me just, so that's, that's, that's pretty much all I wanted to say about uh, what I've done, uh, but I wanna conclude by, by telling you some stuff that I'd, I'd like to know. Uh, and, and maybe the most pressing, uh, the most conspicuously absent uh, theorem from this talk is like, uh, is like a wall crossing formula. Uh, uh, so a, a tractable expression for the difference uh, of two of these classes uh, when, when they're chosen from uh, adjacent chambers, right? So, so if we knew this, then using this recursion for the Euler characteristic in this particular chamber, you know, we could compute the Euler characteristic in any chamber. Uh, but, uh, you know, as I haven't been able to, to, to get anywhere with this, but I, I would love to, to see or to derive a, a, such a wall crossing formula. Uh, Another thing I'd really like to know is, is an asymptotic formula for the Euler characteristic of M bar of N. So again, this is the special case uh, where you're maximally ramified over zero and unramified over infinity. Uh, so, so the inspiration for this would be Menin's beautiful formula uh, for the asymptotic Euler characteristic of M zero N plus one bar, uh, which is you know, something like N to the N minus one you know, up to this E squared minus two E. Uh, so, so he deduces this from, from the, the fact that those two generating functions I showed you earlier are inverse, or he, he states that Zagi showed him how to deduce it uh, and, and, and leaves out the actual derivation. But uh, I would love uh, A, to learn how this derivation works and B, to see if that derivation can be applied to say something uh, about the, the asymptotic formula uh, to, to derive some sort of asymptotic uh, for M of N bar. Uh, so, so something I'm pretty sure about, but but haven't written down uh, uh, too carefully, is that the that the Euler characteristic of m of n bar uh, totally dominate or dominates the Euler characteristic of m zero n bar or uh, n zero n plus one bar as n goes to infinity. So there is much more cohomology, but I, an asymptotic formula would tell us, you know, precisely precisely how much more. Uh, I, I'd also really like to see a formula for the equivariant, or at least a recur recursive formula uh, for the SN equivariant or their characteristic of M of N bar. So, so, so these SN equivariant stories are like really beautiful uh, in the cases of, 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 of stable curves. So I'm wondering if there's, if there's something uh, almost as beautiful uh, in this case. So, so what does this mean? Uh, the, 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 so SN acts on M of N bar by permuting uh, the marked points over infinity and therefore acts on the on the cohomology ring so it's a graded sn representation so i'd like to know the you know the alternating sum i mean it would be great to know the, the each cohomology group as an sn rep representation but at least i'd like to know the the alternating sum as an sn as a virtual sn representation and i, I think perhaps that's an approachable approachable problem uh, uh, I'd, uh, something I'd really, really like to know is, is how, how uh, these relative stable map spaces uh, fit into this whole uh, operatic uh, uh, formalism. So, so uh, I mean, tongue in cheek, I mean, it should maybe be uh, straightforward for M of N bar, or this is me saying straightforward, it's just that I, I think it should work uh, for M of N bar somehow, uh, because there's, there's such a nice uh, recursive structure uh, determined by grafting trees together. Uh, but what I'd really like to know is, is for general, general X, is there some operatic formalism uh, for, for thinking about all X at once? And maybe this is, this is something that I, I'm likely to, to continue thinking about. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, just to leave you with a, a conjecture, 
So I, I'd like to know something about churn numbers uh, other than the Euler characteristic, which is the degree of the top uh, churn class of the tangent bundle. Uh, and the conjecture is that as is that for any any churn number, uh, uh, the, that that churn number should should be piecewise polynomial in X with the chambers of polynomiality uh, uh, given by uh, the resonance chambers. Uh, and and uh, the last thing I'll leave you with is that this is actually true uh, when if, if we're looking at C one times C n minus four, uh, because in that case the the corresponding churn number turns out to be uh, expressible is, is somehow universally expressible in terms of the Hodge numbers, which of course have to be constant uh, because of the first uh, theorem of this talk. But I'd like to be great to know this for for other uh, churn numbers. Anyway, that's that's all I have. So so thanks. <laughs>